Hello and welcome to the ninth episode of the Ultimate Health Podcast. My name is Jesse Chappis and I'm here with my co-host, Marnie Wasserman. Hi everyone. Today we have Anthony Anderson on the show. Anthony is great. This is an amazing interview. We talk about his health journey and how things have changed over the years. We discuss his diet and again how that's evolved to where he's currently at. We talk about his food forest he grew in Minnesota and it's pretty amazing what he's done there. He's he's created an area where he grows a lot of his own food. He's got a greenhouse that he put together himself and it just sounds really impressive. So you're going to learn a lot about growing food, mineralizing soil, and, and how to have the best soil ever. And you're also going to hear about his company now, Grow Paradise, and some of the upcoming retreats he's going to be doing in Hawaii. And you're just going to really get a good feel for who Anthony is and what he's all about. He's really personable, and it's a great show. Yeah, enjoy it, guys. Go check out growparadise.com. That's Anthony's website. And for the show notes, head over to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash 009. So here's Anthony Anderson. Hello, Anthony, and welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast. We're so excited to have you on today's show. Likewise. Thank you so much for having me, guys. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. We got a lot of health and urban gardening, many topics we can't wait to dig into with you. Yeah, very cool. I'm excited. Good. So let's start from the top. We really want to hear a little bit about your story and your health journey and where you're at today. Okay. Um, my journey is d- d- definitely a different one, uh, especially with the health and how, how I came into this. Uh, I grew up in Minnesota in the United States, very middle class. Um, I wouldn't say unconscious, but I definitely was not thinking about food. I, I ate everything. You know, we would just make a lot of, pro- you know, a lot of processed white food, like white bread and white sugar. Uh, we would make a lot of things that I, I really wouldn't eat these days, but uh, when I was about 17, 18, I was starting to make the connection with my acne, my, my poor skin health, with my diet. And so I started to cut out um, Coca-Cola and other sodas, and then I started drinking more water at the time. And getting more into like making chicken breast sandwiches on, on like my George Foreman grill while I was in college, and but still not feeling the effects. I was kind of thinking that it was connected, but my acne was definitely better. So when I was about 22, I started reading, just about finishing up with university, I was reading a lot of books about environmentalism and, you know, things about, you know, making the world a better place and some, I was getting a little more politicized. And I came across, you know, veganism and vegetarianism as a way to combat factory farming. And because I was seeing some of these PETA videos and it was very alarming and I felt like um, factory farming and then becoming a vegan, those were the connections. So when I was about 22, 23, I lived in Paris and I was um, modeling there. I, I never modeled really before. I was doing it a little bit in college, but not too much. And I had the opportunity to go out to Europe in 2003. And I was, I read a book called Thoreau, um, uh, Walden by Henry David Thoreau. And it was really about simplicity. And my life was changing. You know, I was living for the first time really without a real job. I was out of school. I didn't have a television. I was living with like German kids and Russian kids. And like my whole world was really opening up. And these books that I was reading, they were really, you know, changing my mind about things. So I started becoming uh, a vegan. And I was um, not quite feeling it yet because I was eating large amounts of cooked starch, you know, like rice and couscous and bread still. But I, w- I was feeling like I was at least being a part of the solution and not part of the problem. And my big change for me was when I moved to New York City at the end of 2004. And I had started to experiment with dumpster diving and freaganism. So mind you, I'm, I'm, I'm a model. I'm a model in New York City. I was starting to work, but I was coming across these books, and they were very profound for me. And one of these books was called Evasion, and it was written by a young man. I think he was 18 or 19, and he um, he finished high school, and then he decided to live off the land, but in a city. So he was foraging, and and this book really had an effect on me, so I started doing it. I, I found a health food shop in the East Village. It's called, If anyone knows New York, it's called Commodities. It's on 10th Street and 1st Avenue. 
And I started going there and I was shocked at the amount of abundant produce I was finding. Like this was early November. So I was finding a lot of kale and arugula, um, lots of apples and pears. And I had four roommates at the time. It was really almost like a Zoolander situation where we had bunk beds and obviously there's a shared fridge and shared kitchen. So every night I'm coming home with probably, I would say, 15 kilos of leafy greens and fruit. And so I ended up buying myself a cheap blender and I started making these really rough green smoothies just to, you know, basically compact my harvest every day. And before I know it, I'm drinking maybe, um, I would say, a half gallon to a gallon of green smoothies every day consistently. But, you know, I was eliminating four times a day, nothing that I'd ever experienced before. Like, there was so much fiber going through my body. And within 10 days to two weeks, I felt like I was, I, I guess I, I've never tried this, but what people would say, like, on speed. I felt like I was on speed. So much energy and clarity. And I would go to sleep at 2 a.m., because I would dumpster dive around 11 p.m. and then I would juice and wash everything. I finish up by about two. This is like a real, really disciplined. And then I'd be drinking my green juice as I was, you know, processing everything. And then I would wake up at like six in the morning, totally alert and just feeling good. And I would, my eyes would just pop open, and I would just lay in bed, not knowing what to do. So I would get up and I would start my day again. And so what was nice was that I was really feeling the effects much quicker than than many other people who start like a health journey. I was feeling it because of the massive amounts of leafy greens going through my body. <laughs> so that gave me a lot of inspiration to carry on, you know, because this was a very unorthodox diet, but I had the incentive because of modeling. And then I was feeling really good. So that, that took me on for a long time. And I started this blog called Raw Model, rawmodel.com, and it was about sharing my story because I felt like maybe if people could see that I was a model and that I was eating well, maybe they would want to eat well too. And my main approach at that time was raw veganism because I'd been reading a lot of books that were very convincing, and I was feeling the effects. You know, I was, I was going through these cleanses, and I was getting a lot of toxins out, so I was feeling really good. And I continued on that journey for about five years until about 2009. And then at that point, I was starting to feel like it was tiring out a little bit, like both socially and maybe even digestively. Like my digestive fire had really gone down. I, I just couldn't process stuff. I was always gassy. Um, it's something, that, something that changed. And a lot of times I felt like I was sort of ignoring it because of all the books that I had read. And I was very convinced and I didn't want to believe that it was wrong. And also socially, I felt like my social circle was very limited to people that were eating the same. And that, that was mostly raw vegan. So I was going to a lot of raw vegan meetups and uh, Drew Mill and Philip McCluskey from We Like It Raw. Back then, we started doing these events like Young and Raw and we're trying to like open up our social circles to more people that wanted to be raw vegans. And I realized that I wanted to hang out with people besides that, besides raw vegans. I was very judgmental at the time. I, I didn't really respect people that weren't vegans mostly. So um, I started to break out of that consciousness in about 2009. And mostly it was because of Daniel Vitalis and his approach to, at first, uh, spring water and making elixirs, which are kind of like hyper juice smoothies, and then his approach then going into animal products, especially animal fats, you know, grass-fed, high-quality animal fats. I was listening to a, an interview on one radio network. It's a man named Patrick Timpone, and he interviews people from all of dis different disciplines. And, pa and um, Patrick interviewed Daniel Vitalis once, and Daniel was talking about these fat-soluble vitamins, and he was talking about the dentist, Weston A. Price, and his journeys in the 1930s and 40s to remote tribes and seeing what they were eating and studying their, their dental health. And, and I, my mind was beginning to open again. Now I was open to some more stuff and also because I wasn't feeling as good as I was before and I was kind of bored. My, you know, the, the raw vegan diet really opened my world up to a lot of superfoods and, you know, using, even just using products like coconut and, you know, all these things that I really had, all these different olives, and I hadn't really been exposed to it otherwise. So I was very grateful for it, but I was still feeling like something was missing, and I always had these sugar cravings, always thinking about my next meal, and quite orthorexic in a way, a little obsessed. 
and uh, I, I, be- I began to open up. So in 2009, I started eating uh, high quality eggs and then goat yogurt and goat kefir. And instantly, I felt a change in my body, and I felt a change really in my mind. I was much more calm, and then again, my sugar cravings went away. So I was like, well, something's definitely happening here, and it really coincided with everything that I've been reading, um, with this Weston A. Price, ancestral diet, paleo, paleo stuff. So um, at that point, from 2009 onward uh, to, to 2014, I've really stuck with that, and I've been eating more animal products, but I'm still doing a lot of salads, a lot of stuff that I always was eating before, a lot of avocados, a lot of coconuts. I still eat fruit, but not as much. When before, I was probably buying, you know, those three-pound bags of apples or oranges every day and eating at least maybe 10 to 12 pieces of fruit. And now it's more like I'll have a little bit of mango chunks with yogurt or I'll have some raspberries in my chia seed pudding or I'll have maybe some apples with almond butter and cinnamon. And that's pretty much it. It's not a cornerstone of my diet like it used to be. That's been replaced more by eggs and yogurt um, and then, let's say, um, fruit. And, yeah, it, it, was very, it was interesting. The biggest, biggest realization for me was realizing that all the fruit I was eating was really a man-made creation from 200 to 100 years ago through, through hybridization and creating sweeter varieties. So I'm looking back, I'm thinking, wow, you know, my ancestors, not more than a few hundred years ago, they were never eating sweet apples. They were never eating these sweet plums. So all of this sugar in my diet now as a vegan, as a raw vegan, was never there before. And maybe that's leading to this blood sugar fluctuation and these cravings. And and after a while, I was starting to get some teeth aches, you know, like I could feel it deep down in some of my molars, just kind of an aching. And once I switched it up, that went away. So I, I think the key for me was to be open, but also just my path was very strange because of the modeling, which was very, very like incentive. It was, it was tough because it also made me a little more obsessed about it, but then it also gave me the willpower to stick with some of my cleansing and, and some of my protocols. Um, and then, of course, you yeah, have the dumpster diving, which was so weird because I was consuming something like $40, $40 a day worth of produce, which I wouldn't have been able to afford otherwise, and then processing that into these smoothies and juices. So it was kind of a different path, but uh, I'm excited the way it worked out, and I feel like now I'm very stable. I, I'm open to new approaches, but I feel really good about things now, and um, my weight has really stabilized. And um, also an interesting thing that I'll touch on with uh, around 2005 to 2006, I developed an eating disorder. And it was, it was mostly because I was trying to be so strict with my diet. And then I would switch over maybe once a month or every two weeks, and I would eat like the worst food. I would go to a, a Chinese buffet or an Indian buffet, and I just consumed so much. And then I would, uh, I would vomit. So I had like a little bit of bulimia for about two years. And so there's definitely something not right. It was it was emotional, but also there was some sort of biochemical thing happening where I wasn't satisfied, and maybe it was making me feel like lonely because of the diet was very ostracizing, or I don't know. But um, I think it's really important to share the ups and downs with our diet story because a lot of people out there are going through the new stuff, and then they can eliminate a lot of suffering because I was suffering a lot and. I felt really alone and because I was the only one that wanted to eat like this and it was hard to meet, hard to meet, you know, a a partner that was interested in eating like that, except if I was going to these meetups and, and, um, it's just, it's been a, it's been a journey for, for certain. So I'm always happy to share. Wow. Anthony, thanks for being so open and honest about your health journey. Um, I've been in this health world for quite a while and I seem to have noticed that a lot of the gurus out there, once they put their flag in the ground and, and state that they're on a certain diet or lifestyle, they're kind of secretive when they start yeah. evolving and adding new things into the routine. So thank you so much for being open about your transition. And I think it's great that you've been listening to your body and transitioning as need be. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think one of the differences for me was that my my income wasn't based on my diet at that point. 
So it wasn't like I had any books published. I just had a blog, you know, I, it was a blog. It was, it was fairly well covered at the time. Like a lot of people were into it. Um, raw model this was. And, um, so I did, I was kind of creating this persona around being a raw model or a vegan model and, you know, doing interviews about that. So when I started to come out as a, at least a vegetarian or even an omnivore, I was receiving a lot of flack from the fruitarian community, the 801010 community. But they, I mean, they give people a hard time for most things. But, and then I was seeing like there were these gurus that raw food people really were looking up to and they were consuming some animal products and not really talking about it. And it just seemed like they were doing a big disservice because a lot of people out there could have benefited from some information. And at least they could, they had the choice, you know, like, Hey, I've been doing this, but now I'm doing this. You have the choice to do whatever you feel like. It's all an experiment instead of being like, no, no, it's still raw vegan all the way, but then doing other things. And I felt like that was just not cool. So for me, luckily, my income was coming from something else, and I could still be very transparent about my journey. Well, thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. And so what are some of the main meals or some of the meals that you're consuming now every day? Yeah, my um, I'd say my staples are based around mostly uh, eggs, and I, I, I rarely find good eggs to buy in any any store, you know, um, even like those vital farm ones are just not so good. So I ended up finding a, a service that delivers to New York City called Utter Milk, and it's spelled, for anyone in this area, U-D-D-E-R-M-I-L-K, Utter Milk, and they deliver every Sunday, and they, they by far have the best eggs I've ever seen, like really dark orange yolks. And when I eat a couple of those, I'm so satisfied compared to eating, you know, the more pale yellow yolks. There's something happening in there. So it's always um, eggs, something maybe with them. Um, I do still eat like sweet potatoes. And lately, because it's fall, we've been roasting butternut squash. And then I'll put, I'll put that in the Vitamix with a little bit of sea salt and grass-fed butter. And right now, I'm mostly I use Kerrygold, Kerrygold butter. It's very accessible, and the color is really good compared to other ones that are more expensive. So I'll blend that with butter and sea salt, and it makes like this really thick, almost like a pudding or a custard, but it's just pure butternut squash, and I've been eating that a lot. I'll have yogurt with chia seeds and raspberries often. I use a lot of stevia drops and a lot of salads still. I'll sometimes eat flesh products, but mostly it'll be like grass-fed beef, or grass-fed bison, something on, on that sort. Or once in a while, we'll do like a roast because I really like to eat the cartilage. And this might sound kind of funny for people, but the cartilage around, you know, like if you order a, a shank or like an elbow, or it sounds so <laughs> grotesque, but and you, <laughs> and you roast it for a very long time, the cartilage around the joints becomes very soft and edible. And the flavor of that food, there's just something about it. And I feel like that's one of the main foods that we're really missing out on. And that's why people suffer from arthritis a lot. And that stuff that really is right in there, we're just missing out. So I love the flavor. And I'll have that maybe like once every couple of weeks. We'll, we'll do like a slow roast of something like a roast beef or a, a pork shank. But always um, super ethical, grass-fed. And, um, you know, like Whole Foods has that one through six rating. And usually we always go for four or four or above. Usually you can't find anything higher than four there, but usually four is where we go for. And it just tastes so good. And um, so that's really my staples. And then I still, yeah, I'll have salad. I'll consume frozen mango chunks from Trader Joe's as well as their frozen organic raspberries. And then, yeah, I'll mix that either with coconut milk or yogurt and chia seeds. So it's it's... It's a little varied, but it's not so much. I kind of stick with the uh, staples now, and it doesn't get old. I grow sunflower sprouts here in New York City, and so we always have that mixed in on top of stuff on the salads. I'll usually buy, uh, for those that like this, um, organic corn tortilla shells from Ezekiel, and we'll make like these tacos, with it, whether it's like a vegetarian taco or uh, something with meat inside, and it keeps it kind of fresh and exciting. Yeah, that's, those are pretty much my staples now. Well, that's great. And what I'm noticing is you've taken a lot of those principles and foods. Well, an example would be the sea salt. Like a lot of that stuff from the raw vegan world yeah. has come through and you're still using that with new foods and new principles. 
that, that's a really good point. I mean, I have to thank the, the raw vegan world so much because it brought me into so many new ingredients and ways to make food and, and yeah, like all the olives that I never knew about, all the, just really, it opens your, you, you realize that there's like 500 different kinds of mangoes and all this stuff that no one else would have been exposed to. So I brought a lot of that with me and I still say it's at least half of my diet with, you know, those sorts of things. I don't consume the same amount of superfoods. I feel like once I switched over to more grass-fed animal products, it just, I don't know. And it kind of depended on the price of things. And I used to have a little phase where if I booked a job here uh, modeling, I would treat myself to a jar of green powder, like a $60 jar of green powder, or, or something like that, or I'd or make a big order from some, some company and, and get a big bag of goji berries or something. And, and now it's really kind of mellowed out. It's just not quite like that anymore. The green powder, I can really relate. I'm consuming the vitamin mineral green almost on a daily basis right now. I think that's a phenomenal product, and it's interesting that that was part of your journey too. That was the one. Um, yeah, I would buy a bottle of vitamin mineral green when I would get like that was my reward to myself. And and um, now I, I I when I was living in Hawaii, we bought a large amount of spirulina pacifica, and we got it for a really good price. So I still do. Um, Actually, lately I've been making this smoothie with about four four raw eggs, um, and I've never received um, I never got salmonella from eating these eggs before. And they're very organic, they're clean. I'll put four eggs in the blender with a, maybe like five or six chunks of mango, and then maybe even like a little bit of coconut milk, and then I'll put in spirulina. And just the flavor is so good. So if I'm consuming one superfood primarily still, it would be that Hawaiian spirulina. Oh, cool. And I think another thing we can take from your journey is the evolution where maybe the raw vegan diet for somebody that is coming into this world from a standard American diet, maybe that is good for them for a period of time uh, to clean the body out and yeah. detoxify and load the body up with vitamins and minerals from plants. I think I think that what happened with me was pro- probably very appropriate because it seemed almost like that is the natural pr- procession where it is it was so cleansing and I felt the effect so quickly and then you know after a little while I felt like I maybe needed a little bit of a shift but still for five years it, I was really really pretty happy with it except towards the end with a little digestive stuff but that could have been my approach to my raw vegan diet because you i mean we all know there's so many different approaches you can do uh, i mean there's just it's unlimited how, how many varieties of a raw vegan diet one can have so um switching that up a little bit was very good but um also yeah it's it's just really cool to just stay open and um, just being, yeah, just being honest with ourselves and seeing what feels right and not letting dogma uh, take a, take a too much of a role, but still kind of listening to those that have been through it. So I think the open mind and the open heart was really um, serving me very, very much. And that makes perfect sense. Even for myself, raw is a big part of my diet, but it's not everything I do eat you know, a little bit of cooked food. It is plant-based for me. That's where I'm at right now. But mm-hmm. I did try... Uh, going raw at one point and uh, it just it just doesn't have the lasting power or you know making me feel as good as I could on a bit of a mixed diet so yeah yeah it, and everyone has to find that for themselves and everyone and everybody is different and that's the biggest take home message I think we can we can share it was it was the absolutes of 100% that I felt really messed me up like I felt like I had to be 100% raw because I read you know David Wolf's first book nature's first law and he ended every chapter with cooked food is poison and so and you know i was really impressionable at the time and i was thinking like why do i have to eat this cooked food if it's poison and but still because i was in for 100 percent raw i then could only go to certain restaurants with people i couldn't go i couldn't hang out with this person that person it really limited me if i were living let's say on the big island of hawaii with a bunch of fruitarians then it would have been much more approachable. But living in New York City in the cold winters, I used to try and power through with these like nutty, heavy superfood smoothies through the through the winter to to stay raw. And oh my god, it was just so taxing on my digestive system to process all that. And if I would have done just a little bit of warm soup, it would have been all good, you know. So I think um, just a little bit of leeway will open up whatever someone needs. You know, if I would have said, okay, let's just aim for 90%, I probably wouldn't have suffered at all. 
but I just felt like I had to maintain that hundred that, that there's a saying and they say like perfection is the enemy of excellence. And I feel like that's what I was going through. I was trying too hard and it would cause me to stumble and then stumble into that bulimia for a while as well. So that hundred percent mentality can be very detrimental. I feel for sure. The whole psychological component of eating, and this is just a little important note for our listeners is you know, people get so caught up in what they think is right or what they're hearing about all the different kinds of fad diets, let's call them, out there. Um, and, you know, they're just so convinced that this is what they should do before they actually tune into their own body mm-hmm. and understand that, you know, they need to figure out what's right for them. And I think it just, it's, it's an evolution that will take people time if they stay committed to realize, you know what, this worked for a little bit and may, maybe doesn't work now. Yeah. So, yeah. And another thing, too, is we, because this is the age of the Internet, people have a voice, and we will sometimes take sales as advice. And a lot of people that are huge proponents of, let's say, a certain superfood or a certain new thing, they're the ones that are selling it, you know, and they're very good at that. And it does have merit, you know, these products, but maybe not the hyper use of it all. And so I started to kind of step back and take it with a grain of salt, being like, well, you know, this person has built a career around maybe, let's say, this product or that product. And I can't really, you know, fully believe that it's going to help me all the time. And there are some sales involved. And the more I stepped back from that and was going more towards just like natural plants, like making salads, making, you know, my other things, it wasn't so complicated. The superfoods kind of added a lot of complication to it. And so, I, yeah, I really think it's important for people just to just, you know, step back and be a little honest about it. Keep it simple, for sure. And really keep it simple, yeah. And I felt the more fat, too. Um, when I, whenever I tried low fat, it, was, it, it could work for a while, but then the cravings will get you. And people will think that it's a protein deficiency, and it was always a fat deficiency. If, um, if someone's ever, like, lost at sea or if they're, you know, somewhere and they bring them back into civilization, they will always go for fat first when they can start eating things. It's just that, that natural craving. And looking back in the uh, archaeological record, it was large amounts of fat. You know, and there was really, you know, a low-fat diet really wasn't an option until now. It's kind of like a newfangled agricultural thing that's happened for the past hundred years. But I'm really, yeah, I'm really hoping that people just stay open, I think, and, and not be too locked in with something that was written maybe 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Like even the Master Cleanse was written maybe in the late 60s or early 70s. And the Master Cleanse can be improved upon greatly. And so buying that little yellow book, we have to realize it was written by a person that had no idea about how awesome honey could be or coconut nectar or because he's just talking about maple syrup, which is a good product, but there's a lot of new things that have been discovered. So, yeah. So, Anthony, food aside, what other habits do you incorporate on a regular basis to maintain your health? Um, I ride bicycle a lot. I have city bike here in, the, in, the, in New York, so I'm always on the bike and I'm always walking. Uh, I I have a regimen of just some push-ups, pull-ups, and sit-ups. And that's pretty much all I do for exercise. And if at most I do that once a week, maybe every other two weeks. And it's just because I'm on my feet a lot. I walk and I ride bikes that I almost have to be careful not to get too skinny. And this is eating a high-fat diet. And, um, and I, I believe this is applicable for everyone, really. It's because I'm eating a lot less sugar. I don't have to wash my weight so much. Before, I would be going to the gym, I kid you not, two hours a day on the treadmill, working out, I don't know, burning off those sugars that I was eating. And now it's, it's really not like that. I just kind of, I, st- I stay active, but it's not on that level. In the city, you have to balance yourself because there's a lot of noise and a lot of energy from people, you know. And so I listen to these um, Peruvian shamanic songs called Icaros. Not necessarily Peru, but in the Western Amazon, Ecuador, Colombia, uh, they're spelled I C A R O S, Icaros. And medicine men, medicine women will sing these beautiful songs. And I listen to them as I ride bicycle or I walk around. And I listen to like really good, positive music and also audiobooks. So those sorts of things are just kind of keep saturating myself with. Um, really helps me emotionally and mentally, especially in like a real huge metropolis like this. Uh, I do breathing exercises and I do a little gratitude meditation before I go to bed, maybe just one minute or two minutes where I lay on my back. I feel like it's much more effective if I'm laying directly on my back instead of on my side. 
I don't know, like if it's, if it's like transmitting something out or something, it feels better. So I lay on my back and I just put my hands on my chest and I just let the gratitude wash over me. I think about all the good things, all the lessons, everything, and I just say thank you for it. And I just feel so good. And I'm not speaking to anything or anyone specific. I'm just putting that feeling of gratitude out there and just letting the universe, per se, know that I feel so good for everything that's happening. And that's very good for me. And then the last thing I would say is that I'm around plants a lot. Um, I, I Luckily, I have a balcony garden here. Um, and we're on the 34th floor, so it's kind of cool. It's like way up high. But we've got a, a lot of parsley and kale growing right now. It's November 1st. And um, I'm being around plants a lot. And it's, I go to Central Park. That kind of energy is something that humanity has been with up until very recently. And it's very healing. It's very calming. And those things give me a lot of uh, energy. It gives a lot back. So I'm working with the plants and listening to those ikaros and just doing a little bit of exercise. Wow, that's great. One thing I got from that, well, I got a few different things, but that you keep things relatively simple. Yeah. Like we talked about before, simplicity. We've all had those periods of time where we would go to the gym, like you said, for a couple of hours and think more is better, but sometimes coming back to simplicity is really the key. Yeah, it really is. There's a term, they call it mental masturbation. And you'll see a lot in the health food world where people will just overthink, overthink. And it's a neurosis. It's a neurosis, like absolutely. And you can't help it because in this day and age, whoever is, I don't know, I call, I call them the controllers in a way, but those people, they've set up so many hurdles for us. And I feel maybe especially in the United States to be healthy, like you have to be conscious about your water and your air and all the food and the condiments. And, and so you almost have to be a little neurotic at first in order to get all your stuff lined up. But then hopefully once you get everything, get all your ducks in a row, so they say, then it just becomes second habit. And you just kind of know exactly, you can be placed in the middle of a Walmart and know what you can get there and that'll still work for you, you know, and, and the really just how to keep it simple. And by keeping it simple, it's just so much more relaxing. And then the compliance, you know, they call that the compliancy is much more easy. You can really stick with it without any headaches and there's no timing issues. My big thing is not to eat late. You know, if I can cut it off by about 7 or 8 p.m. at the latest, and then just have some water. That's another good thing for me. And by eating larger fat meals in the evening or late afternoon, I'm very satiated and I don't feel like I have to snack too much. Uh, if anything, maybe a little yogurt and some mango. But eating eating earlier is definitely good for me as well. Yeah, simple. simple All right, good. Anthony. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned growing plants in an urban situation in New York. I know planting your own food is a huge passion here. Can you share a little bit about how that's evolved over the years and what you're doing now to plant your own food? Cool, cool. It came out of, uh, it was actually, a, it, was, it was a marriage of wanting a simple life and a life without a lot of monthly bills. And then the, on the other side, coupled with eating the best food possible. And then limit, and be, I was already on the, the track of eating well. This was probably... 2006 when I started to think more about the plants and I owe a lot of this to David Wolf because he was talking about ocean grown wheatgrass and you know growing your own and all these things some videos that he was doing from Hawaii and it was very inspirational I was thinking wow this is the best you know to to grow the to grow the plant and then pick it and then I was already getting into wild food foraging so I'm thinking well wow why can't people just plant these foods in their front yard so they don't have to walk around and but um, it was it was really David Wolf. I owe I owe a lot to him because he really kind of sparked that fire. And my mom was always into you know minor landscaping, a little bit of a very small veggie patch, nothing serious. And then when I came back home in the summer times, I started to expand a little more. And, you know, we had something in the backyard, and I was helping her plant stuff. And then I started to sketch. I was like had this vision of like uh, my yard in the future, and I would draw out these sketches and I felt really good about it and I was drawing all the different trees and and then in 2008 I bought some property across the road from my parents place and I established a food forest there in uh, the summer of 2008 and so it was um it's a, a kind of a quick journey and I owe to food and I think now that 
the whole foodie revolution, people getting into quality food, you know, whether it's from uh, TV or the magazines or just the restaurants being around, that is like the gateway drug into growing your own because it's now an appreciation for ingredients and then local. And then it's just, it's only a natural step to go into, well, I'm just going to plant some stuff in my backyard. And I was growing stuff on my fire escape here in Queens. When I was living in Queens, I was growing wheatgrass, a little sunflower, and kale. And you know, it wasn't serious, but it was something that felt good, and it was supplementing my diet. And again, just to kind of be around those plants, even if you're not going to eat them, there's something very nourishing about just being around them. And uh, then it just became full on. I discovered permaculture in 2006, 2007. And permaculture is a landscape design science that benefits both nature and humans. So I like to think of it as edible landscaping. You know, you got your backyard and you basically turn it into the Garden of Eden. And this was, I mean, when you start thinking like this, you go through a lot of revelations. And you're like, wow, why do, why, you know, all the leaders in our society, why aren't they talking about this? And why is there all this, like, food poverty issues and people are sick and everyone's hungry and, and people have so much money, but their backyards are just lawn. And it just seems like you're now living in the twilight zone because the most obvious answer is right out in plain sight, yet people with the resources, people with the influence, nobody's thinking about it. And people are suffering, you know, greatly in the developed world. You know, we always think like we have to send money to Africa or Asia, but people are in poverty here, you know, and not even the people with low income, but the people with a lot of income. There's poverty happening. They're not living fulfilled lives and their backyards are empty and they could be living in the Garden of Eden with their kids and, and parents, but instead it's it's much more, it's lacking, you know. So once I was thinking about this, I was like, oh, this is the answer, you know. And all we have to do is basically bring back the Garden of Eden into our life and, you know, this term of paradise creation. So really um, the plants seem to be the answer, embracing the plants, getting the trees, thinking about the soil, there's an excellent animated film called The Man Who Planted Trees. I can't recommend it enough. Um, it's originally a French story, and then they um, they created a, a beautiful film with it, and it's about 30 minutes long, and it's the story of this man who planted uh, an entire forest in the 1920s and 30s and brought all the springs back. Um, it's just It was a forest, and before it was just a desert. Um, in southern France, so um, a lot of a lot of things start coming into into your mind when this happens. So I feel like by incorporating a garden into our lives, almost all of our problems are washed away, especially like a really productive garden. And that's spiritual, emotional, economical, everything. You know, um, obviously health wise, and really just incorporating a garden into our lives is very very healing. Yeah, it seems like such a simple answer, yet yeah. it's so few and far between people taking advantage of their yards and their landscapes. Yeah. Typically, like you said, it's a lawn and a couple of trees that aren't producing any yeah. food or anything really for the person. So that's yeah. a great point. Um, even on the city level, I would look around at all the trees that the city would plant and none of them were edible. I'm like, wow, why aren't they, you know, free food for people? Or maybe they were discouraging the animal population. I don't know. But it just seemed like it was such a clear, easy answer. Have you heard of that website? I think it's fallingfruit.org. And for everybody listening, there's yeah. going to be show notes where on ultimatehealthpodcast.com, you guys can go there and we're going to have links to all these different headings and topics we're talking about. So don't worry about writing things down. Uh, you said you'd heard of that, Anthony? I have, yes. Falling for it. Very nice. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever taken advantage of that? And no. When no. Pick, no. Yeah. What that is, everybody, it's a website where you can go on and people can put up different, uh, the location of different plants that are producing food, fruit, and, and you can go there and, and feel free to pick what you want and make use of all that fruit and food that's just going to waste. Mm-hmm. What's really awesome about that site is that it gives us the idea that our garden just is not in our backyard. Like the garden can become the neighborhood. And if there's an empty spot, you can plant 
burdock or nettles or, or even like astragalus, things that don't need so much babysitting, it can become, you know, much more than just a backyard veggie patch. And with the trees and, and then, yes, people sharing locations, it, feels, it becomes like a, a tribe. Uh, I, I love that site. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing about the Internet. It connects everybody, and, and that's a beautiful way we can all share and, and keep connected. So, yeah. And, Anthony, a common theme I'm noticing throughout the interview is quality. Quality of food is such an important and, I find, underestimated topic. I mean, you can have an egg, your typical egg you're going to pick up at the supermarket, or you can have an egg that, actually, I remember seeing a YouTube video you put out a while back where you're feeding the chickens wheatgrass and all kinds of amazing superfoods. So the difference between the two eggs is like night and day. So it's not as easy as just saying, yeah, eggs, no to butter. Yeah, like you, exactly. It's such a continuum of quality, and I think that's important for people to grasp and, and understand. Yeah, so much, so much. I mean, when I first got into healthy eating, it was more in the vegetarian, vegan realm. So there was a very black and white viewpoint on, on this, and there was no mention of grass-fed or... Um, CLA, conjolinic linoleic acid, and the, these things, you know, or megas, or just all the, all these things. It was just black and white, like animal foods bad, plant foods good, and it was, a, it was again a disservice because there are quite huge differences. And eating animal products from factory farms is extremely detrimental to our health. But eating animal products from permaculture farms and people that really love their animals and you can see it in the food. It's, it, 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 I feel personally that it is health food. Like eating grass-fed butter is health food. And um, I suffered for many years by avoiding those foods. And I really wish that I would have incorporated it a little bit more. And I just was really kind of buying into the, the black and whiteness of it all. Right. And staying on the topic of quality, that also applies to plants and and I know you're big into producing the highest quality plants that are going to produce high quality fruit. So can you talk a little bit about say rock dust and some of the other ways we can take those plants to the next level? Yes, yes. Yeah, this is this is very exciting because this these are old technologies and new technologies that most of the commercial farming uh community, you know, people that have the huge fields, the monocultures, this is not even, uh, this is a whole different galaxy for them. So um, rock dust, one of my favorite rock dusts is called Azomite. It's from Utah. It's spelled A-Z-O-M-I-T-E. And it's low in, so, it's, it's low in sodium, so you can apply it more to your, um, to your land without worrying about over-salting and um, realizing how demineralized our soils have become because when trees usually put out leaves, um, those leaves are full of the minerals from the soil, and then they drop those leaves. Naturally, those leaves would decay back into the soil, but we humans usually rake those leaves up and throw them away. So it's like a suction has been occurring for decades of minerals getting sucked out, dropped on the ground, raked out, and then exported. And so we're really missing a lot of that, which was originally there. And by adding in the rock dust, another thing for me is the ocean-grown minerals or the ocean minerals where uh, one of the sites, I believe, is called Ocean Grown. And you're using, I was doing this with wheatgrass, you're using diluted ocean water. And you can do this at home with just sea salt. And at a ratio of, you need a tester to usually do it, but you can kind of feel 1,500 parts per million of, of the minerals inside the water. And adding that to the wheatgrass or to the trees, and it just loves, it really loves those minerals. And then another huge one for me was getting into Paul Stamets' work of mycorrhizal fungi, mycorrhizal fungi, and how many times that fungi has been stripped away from the land. It's when you like lift up a log and you see those little white fibers, and those fibers will travel all through the forest, and the trees can communicate with each other. Uh, they can share nutrients. By encouraging that mycorrhizal fungi, uh, I saw the mineral uptake just increase greatly, increase greatly. And then also another thing which really was something that I did not have to buy was by incorporating large amounts of mulch into my garden, you know, really protecting the soil with six to 10 inches 
of, of good mulch, and then that mulch slowly breaks down and feeds the soil life. So the worms and everything, really appreciating the soil is the key. If you love the soil, your plants will always do very well. What monocrop commercial growers, um, they kill their soil. They use it as like a sponge to absorb the, the chemical nutrients that they apply. But when you're doing organic gardening, permaculture gardening, you love the soil, you want worms, you want all these different animals, and the numbers are insane. A bacteria, fungi, um, macro, macro fungi, all these sorts of things that are just huge. By loving the soil, it's, everything falls into place. You know, the trees are always happy, the plants grow super well. And then when you, let's say, like I harvest rhubarb, and there's these big leaves, that most people would just chop off and then throw in the garbage, I'll take those leaves and I'll put them around the base of the rhubarb or I'll put them at the base of the tree and then let them decay back into the soil so nothing's ever wasted. It always really thinking of like a closed loop cycle. And one other big thing I've noticed is that there is a movement towards veganic farming, which uses a lot of rock dust and ocean minerals. It's good, but I've seen a lot of success with people using organic animal manures whether that's from rabbits, chickens, cows. Um, if the animals are eating the right foods, something magical happens. So they transmute that into something, and the manure is very, very good for plants. And sometimes you have to let that manure break down a little bit, but um, there's so many nutrients in there, and it's like the bacteria, the, the soil life really loves it. And by so incorporating those three things, like the rock dust, uh, the, which would also kind of apply to the ocean minerals, that sort of thing. We're just all about remineralizing the soil, the, the mulching, the mycorrhizal fungi, and then if possible, animal manures. You know, if you can have chickens or rabbits, feed them your scraps. Not everybody can do this, but feed them your scraps so you don't even have to worry about compost anymore. You're basically feeding your pet who's then producing, whether it's eggs or manure, um, good energy. I mean, that's you start to look around at cats and dogs and you feel like they're just freeloaders because um, they're not really adding to at least the soil health or they're, they provide a lot of emotional health for people, but they're not giving back in the other ways like some of the other animals do. Okay. So to break this down, basically you want healthy soil, which is going to in turn produce healthy, healthy plants, plants, and then the fruit coming off is going to be more mineralized and healthy for the body. So it's all, you're, you're creating a whole nother cycle where you're going to have better quality food in the end and it's going to help your health. Yep. That's it. It all, I mean, human health boils down to soil health and that's what's so mind boggling is how in our culture, people just trash the soil, you know, and they let it wash away, they poison it. And then we wonder why, you know, even the mental health of us is, you know, failing so much. I feel, I feel like there's so many missing pieces. And it's so simple. It's just love the soil, you know. Give the soil what it was always supposed to have, minerals, mycorrhizal fungi, and a lot of mulch. And at that point, you don't have to worry about droughts. You don't have to worry about, you know, everything. It just They almost take care of themselves at that point. And the thing is, organic fruit and veg they end up containing more minerals because of the soil practices are, are better quality compared to the conventional, right? Yes, and it's a big thing that a lot of conventional growers or even the mainstream media will basically lie about. And they'll say that conventional fruits and vegetables have the same amount of nutrients. It's not true. And one thing is it's a huge blanket statement because it depends on the grower and it depends on where they're growing. But if it's a conventional grower, they're poisoning the soil. So there's just, you're not going to see those minerals. You're not going to see, they're not, they're not compost, adding compost back. They're not mulching. It, every, every time the organic is better. And the organic isn't sprayed with all the pesticides and fungicides. I mean, that, that alone is enough for me. Like, I've had enough of that in my life, in my teens, and, you know, growing up. I don't need any more of that stuff. You know, it, I think it messed us up way more than we realize. And when I detoxed all that in my 20s, I just don't want it anymore, you know. So I really, I'm not into it. And I, I really get a little frustrated when people try and confuse innocent people into thinking that it's the same food just so they can feel better about maybe saving a couple extra dollars by poisoning themselves. Like, why would I want to save a few dollars to poison myself? You know, it's, I'd rather spend a couple of extra dollars and have food that's actually good for me. You know, so it's th those few things. It's almost like a magic spell. Once that spell's broken, 
it's almost like they don't have control over you anymore because you're not eating their food. So then you don't need their medicines and you don't really, you're not entertained by them anymore. It's just like a lot of stuff that just falls to the wayside. For sure. And one of the big words right now being genetically modified is becoming, you know, the next hot topic. So it's not even so much about organic anymore. It's about yeah. the GMOs found in our food system. So what are some of your thoughts on that and what's taking place with that in the food industry? It's um, by, I, I'm, I'm happy that it's becoming more mainstream, but I'll talk to some people and they don't even, you know, these are what you would call smart people. They're in their thirties. They don't even know what a GMO is. You know, and this is, so this is kind of how we still have a ways to go where in our community, we, we know the ins and outs of all this, but those are the people that are just getting by day by day. They're watching TV at night. They don't know what GMOs are. And you open the fridge and it's nothing but GMOs. And then they're suffering from it, clearly suffering. So um, when I was, I was already quite into health food by the time I got tuned into GMOs. This is probably like 2007, 2008. And it was, um, uh, it was, I can't remember what movie this was, but just being in, you know, just being in the world of health food and, and I, what was cool was I thought if somebody could get awake about GMOs and then cut GMOs out of their diet, that is, that is a huge, huge victory because by then they're cutting out corn syrup, they're cutting out soybean oil, they're cutting out all processed, processed foods by going on a non-GMO diet. Uh, all the processed foods go away. And I'm happy that people are becoming more awake about it and that these companies like Monsanto and Syngenta and um, all the fast food companies, they're spending so much money to try and continue to confuse us. So it is hurting them a little bit in the pocketbooks, but um, it's still a big battle that needs to be fought. And um, I think that's the, that's really the front line. If people can get awake about GMOs, a lot of other things will will be very good because... I, I don't know, maybe it's different in Canada, but I, I just feel like it's some sort of sinister plot. And a lot of people will just say that it comes down to money and that Monsanto is just giving these politicians money and such, but I feel like it's so much more sinister. And that saying that it's money is an easy excuse somehow for people. Like, they're allowed to poison people as long as money's involved, but I feel like it's darker, you know? And in just regardless of any of that... Um, is what they do to the plants. I mean, the plants are genetically modified so they can have Roundup sprayed on them or even injected into the seed somehow. With, uh, I really, um, I can't believe that it's even legal, but um, by getting into the lifestyle that we appreciate, usually it's um, it just doesn't become an issue anymore, but all of our loved ones still eat this stuff, especially in the United States. And you see so much inflammation and weird autoimmune uh, diseases coming up that probably would not not be occurring. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful, and compared to 10 years ago, it's a huge wake-up call. People are definitely waking up, but we still have a ways to go. I mean, most of our friends, you know, in the non-health food world don't really know about GMOs yet. And then it almost seems like kind of like, oh, great, like I have to cut this random thing out of my diet, you know? But that's what, I mean, that's what growing up is all about. You know, we have to know what's good for us and what's not good, what serves us and what doesn't. And by becoming awake about these things, we can empower ourselves much, much more. So I'm hopeful. And I think it's on Tuesday, there's some big elections in Oregon and Colorado, I believe, for GMO labeling. And every two years, it seems to be like a big thing. And let's hope that this time it comes through. So we'll see. Well, I think a big problem right now is that it's hard for us to trust the people at the top. There's so much misinformation out there, information that is contraindicating other information, and it's just hard for the average person who's busy to sort through everything. And that that goes for GMOs and what's a healthy diet and yeah. and healthy lifestyle. So it, I I really do feel for the people that aren't able to take the time to really sort through this stuff and do what's right for their body. Yeah. I sometimes I kind of wonder wonder about these things and almost wonder if the people at the top are really instituting some sort of hyper Darwinian evolution where they're throwing so many curveballs at humanity and they're trying to thin out the population to, to just those that are witty enough to avoid all the hurdles. Because it seems like they're really aiming for people, like they're really gunning to get, you know, people to have a much shorter lifespan, more infertility, 
lack of quality of life, you know, where they have to be hooked up to a machine at 60 or 65 instead of at 80, and uh, just turning this into these, you know, quick-lived robots that, you know, pay taxes and it sounds a little morbid, but I think if if we can see that, then we can start to take the steps to free ourselves, you know, getting more into permaculture, growing our own food, maybe living somewhere with clean air. I don't know if um, people are into the chemtrail controversy, chemtrails, but um, when I was a kid, I never saw thick white lines uh, against the sky that would turn into uh, a gray haze. You know, I never saw that. And they do that now. And I don't trust them. I, not only I don't trust them, but I feel like they're gunning for me. Like, I feel like they're coming out for us. So it's a little paranoid, but it also is very empowering. And because of that, I've come through it. And I'm not depressed about it. Even if I feel like my government is trying to depopulate us, I, um, which sounds like crazy, but I feel like I, now that I know it, I'm more, I'm more prepared. And that's why I feel like I'm, I want to move to Hawaii. I want to grow my own food. Uh, I want to avoid GMOs. You know, all these things are a wake-up call. And maybe in some weird twist, they're doing us a favor by, by I don't know, waking us up. or I, I don't know what's going to happen in the next 20, 30 years, but it's, things are speeding up very quickly. And whether it's on purpose or not, we're, we're fronted with a lot of interesting challenges that if we succeed, I think we'll, we'll live and we'll continue to reproduce. And our children will carry it on, but or if not, you know, we're gonna. I'm wondering even about like fertility pills. Like if people didn't have fertility pills, where would where would we be right now? And all these things that we've really become dependent upon just to stay healthy and reproduce. So um, there's a lot happening right now. So it's really a crucial time in our history that we have to be so informed and so ready to take direct action and to really absolve the politicians of any responsibility because they can't be trusted. I feel like the responsibility lies within ourselves and our own communities, and we've been fragmented a lot. So there's a lot of healing to be done on that. So uh, looking into it, I think um, I think at the right time, we just have to be educated. And that's what like websites like your guys' uh, everything. It's, it's, the Internet is a huge blessing as long as we're using it for good. Right. That makes a lot of sense. And that kind of takes me to our next point here, homesteading. So if you want to separate mm-hmm. yourself from the machine or what's going on in the world today and kind of take things on on your own a little bit, do you want to explain what homesteading is and sure. explain things like rocket mass heaters and, and just some of the big, big aspects of that? Sure. Um, homesteading, I'm not sure on the actual, like, I always see it as... Um, almost like the old pioneer days, you know, we can still do that, do, do this now where you have, let's say one acre, two acres, a hectare, and you, you, you have a, a home and everything is pretty much self-reliant. Um, you're producing your own energy through solar or wind. You're harvesting rainwater. You're producing a large amount of your food, um, these sorts of things. So you're becoming more insulated from some of the geopolitical stuff that's happening in the world, any kind of food shortages, even food prices. It's, it's all about insulating us from, from that no more negative activity. Um, planting a lot of stuff, getting the home started. And, you know, it's more of a lifestyle now because in the pioneer days, it was all like very cut and dry, you know, like, you know, this and this and this, and and now it's a blend because we're still living in cities. But you can almost have an urban homestead by incorporating sprouts and having um, your own these little solar generators to power things, power small electrics, and um, even composting toilets, those sorts of things. So homesteading is like creating your own little paradise. And by yet another, like what you said, the rocket mass heater, a good site for rocket mass heaters. You can always Google them. But Permies, permies Permies.com, and that's P-E-R-M-I-E-S, Permies.com. It's a forum, but there's a really good rocket mass heater segment in there. and It's basically a wood-burning oven or a wood-burning furnace that holds most of its heat and it's super efficient. You use about 90% less wood to do the same amount of cooking and heating. And because of that, you can then use basically scrap wood you know, that either you find in the form of branches or stuff that you find like people are throwing away, like pallets. And you can basically warm your home and cook your food for free. So this rocket mass heater, in my opinion, is a free energy machine because it's so efficient and most of the materials that we use for the fuel 
are in fact free. Even cardboard. There was a man um, who was burning all of his junk mail through his rocket mass heater. And he said that he warmed his home last winter with his junk mail. It's pretty funny. Um, <laughs> I like that. And there's a lot of different designs, but it's just a very efficient way of where it, the flame goes in. You'd almost have to see a diagram online, but there's like a, a chimney, but as as the flame comes out of the chimney, it's trapped in a barrel, and then the exhaust goes down and out a tube, and you can build a bench on that tube, which will stay nice and warm. So all that heat slowly radiates throughout the night instead of just being lost like a regular wood stove. And, you know, it's the same thing. Like, yeah, it's nice to have a wood stove in, in your cabin, but if you're burning so much wood, you know, it's really not sustainable. So these rocket mass heaters are very, very efficient. And tying them into homesteading with all the other things, like even a solar cooker, um, yeah, like I said before, catching rainwater, um, having the animals on site, getting into, you know, more foraging, making your own food. Before you know it, basically your only bills are maybe a little bit for the car and property tax. And maybe going on trips because you have so much extra money because no longer you're spending money on energy, housing, and food. You know, I always thought that if, if our government was benevolent, those needs should almost be designed in where um, we don't have to pay for our needs anymore. So, I mean, we've been building buildings for a very long time, and there should be enough buildings for people. And especially, you know, with energy collection and all the waste, the needs should be really designed in so we don't have to work for them. And if we want to continue to work, we can use our earnings for more wants, like travel, um, maybe a computer or certain types of clothing that we might want, more luxury goods. But it's really um, the needs, I think, is what really taxes people so hard because they're spending maybe like 75% on just needs. If we can, whether, I think it's up to us, you know, we have to do it ourselves. So by living like in a cool cabin, having solar panels, we can live a life with hardly any monthly bills. And then definitely you're free to do whatever you feel like. You know, if you want to get into writing or meditating or art, um, but you're free to do it because you no longer have the screws put on you to be pulling in 2000 to $4,000 a month to pay for everything. Wow, that's very interesting. And that takes me to the next topic I want to touch on a little bit. Your food forest you've uh, created in Minnesota. Tell us a little bit about that property and uh, mm-hmm. how that's evolved over the years. Cool, cool. <laughs> this is, you know, I used to lay in bed at night and just like think about this, this place and what I could do to it. And that's when you know that you're like in the sweet spot and you're just laying in bed thinking about this thing. And I started it in 2008. And of course, there's a lot of things that I would have been differently now. I learned more about building ponds and waterfalls later on. I wish I would have incorporated some of that before. Um, but it's a permaculture garden. It's a food forest. Uh, and it's in, it's in central Minnesota. So I'm in zone 4B for those that are into that stuff. It's quite cold. It gets to about negative 30, possibly even negative 40. And that's Celsius and Fahrenheit. Um, it's, it's nasty. So all the stuff that I grow there are very cold hardy, like apples, plums, pears, uh, sour cherries, even stuff from Mongolia and northern China that I ordered, like honeyberries and sea buckthorn, really cool items like that. And um, I mixed in also, you know, like a perennial garden, that's, um, gar- a perennial garden with some rhubarb and as- um, asparagus, and I'll always put tomatoes in and some corn, organic corn once in a while. But the core, the backbone of this garden is the trees, the vines, and the uh, the berries. And so I have a lot of nut trees planted as well, like walnuts, hickory, um, stuff like nitrogen fixers, you know, like the black locust or the honey locust, which will then feed other other plants nearby. Um, this is a big thing, you know, where I want to plant plants that do the work for me. You know, so if I plant a black locust next to an apple tree, I no longer have to feed the apple tree nitrogen because the black locust is feeding that nitrogen. And then the black locust is basically a tree for the bees because it, it puts out a lot of flowers. And it's a tree that makes excellent firewood. And so now I have this. It's really for homesteading. The black locust is an excellent, excellent tree. Check it out on YouTube. Um, a lot of raspberries, a lot of grape vines. Uh, I have a dome greenhouse that I, that I built. I built it myself, and I kind of wish that I would have paid a professional to build it 
because it could be a little more airtight and just more, you know, it was, I, I built it a little sloppy. I was kind of in a rush and, and it does work and it's much, much warmer in there in the winter than outside, but it could be a little more efficient. In that greenhouse, I have stuff like persimmons, fuzzy kiwis, um, a plant called the Goumi, G-O-U-M-I, which is a nitrogen-fixing berry shrub. Um, I have a lot of comfrey. I have grapes inside as well. My grapes in there ripen far faster than the grapes outside. And, um, yeah, persimmons and figs. So it's um, at first I, I had this idea that I was going to grow avocados and mango and guava in this greenhouse. But I was spending $200 a month on propane to keep it warm. And I was like, well, this isn't even, this is silly. You know, it's not even, I'm going to have to do this every year, you know, like $200 a month, you know, in propane. So it made no sense. So what I did was I took those trees out, put them in pots, brought them in the house, and then I replaced them with things like more like Mediterranean cold that can survive inside that greenhouse without electricity or heat. So that was stuff more like the persimmons, the figs, uh, the kiwis, stuff that's maybe hardy to... 10 Fahrenheit, um, 5 Fahrenheit, instead of, you know, more like 40. So it saved me a lot of time, money, and energy having those plants instead. And then, um, yeah, yeah, so it's two acres. I keep expanding more. Um, There's a website in the States called Lawyer Nursery, like the occupation Lawyer Nursery. And they sell a lot of smaller trees by mail order, and but they're very affordable. So since I have more time with this garden now, I'm not there so much. I, I plant a lot of those ones. A lot of June berries, um, or otherwise known as Saskatoons. I, I grow a lot of those. They grow very well. I, I love them so much more than blueberries because they're huge and they're more purple than blue. And, and so a lot of different things that most people have never seen before. And when I walk around that garden now, I mean, it's been seven, almost seven years, and it's just like covered in birds and, and there's bees everywhere. And, and you just stand in the middle of it and you're like, wow, like I created this thing with nature, you know, it's like a co-creation with mother nature and it almost just, it can choke you up for a little bit because I mean, the, the thought of it, the ramifications can bring tears to your eyes because you realize that almost by yourself, I, I received a little bit of help from my parents with watering. Um, but otherwise I did it all by hand by myself. Um, there was a bobcat skid loader that came in and built a few swales the first day, but otherwise um, I was just planting and planting and, and you just feel so, um, I don't know, fulfilled or justified or something that you created this little slice of paradise that, you know, your parents can enjoy in their retirement and maybe your t- future children can enjoy when they're, when they're running around and just something very special about it. So I'm, I'm very happy that I did it when I did. I didn't know as much as I do now. So, but I'm, I'm glad that I did it and that I didn't wait, you know, and that's the biggest thing I think is a lot of people have fear that they don't have enough knowledge so they'll sit on their backyard or whatever for years and then nothing happens and those trees could be producing by now, you know? So I mean, just, just get the trees in, love the soil, whatever kind of hardscaping they call it, like where you need a machine to come in and build a pond or something, get that all taken care of so they don't have to come back in. And the biggest key is to draw it out on paper, really envision it. And then the manifestation becomes much, much quicker. Good for you, and that must be really rewarding to have grown your own little paradise, especially in in somewhere like Minnesota, which oh, yeah. <laughs> you know a lot of people so you know wouldn't associate it with having all this beautiful harvest. So that's amazing. Oh, it's, love to see it someday. Oh, it's so it's so much. And then just this August, uh, my mom um, was holding my niece, so my mom's granddaughter, and we were in the gra- in the greenhouse, and she, and my and my mom's holding her, you know, and she's picking the grapes off. She's two years old, and she's eating the grapes. Uh, from the greenhouse. And I was like, God, this moment never would have happened otherwise, you know? And my little niece just eating grapes, you know, as my, as my mom holds her, you know, it's like so special. And uh, it's something that so many people miss out on because for whatever reason, and, and it was just such a beautiful moment that never would have happened if it wasn't for planting those grapes and building that greenhouse. And it's, um, it really comes back to you like a million fold. It, and it's so much more than just food. It's like really deep spiritual, emotional feelings that come by creating that paradise 
Yeah. And then, and then to do it with your loved ones. I did it mostly alone, but to do it with your partner or with your parents or your kids, how rewarding is that? Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and to eat, eat the fruits of your labor. to like, actually, Literally. You know, and, and, literally. And you said earlier how you're not even eating much fruit these days, but this is obviously the best kind of fruit to eat because yes. it's, it's your own. And you're, it sounds like you're doing a lot of the like sour berries, the tart little, like the wild stuff. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah. Sounds amazing. One of my favorite ones now is called the Nanking Cherry. And it's a little sour cherry. It grows to about 9 to 10 feet tall, about 3 meters. And it's just really uh, very cold hardy. And the deer never eat it. And it's just uh, they don't nibble on the branches or anything. It's just beautiful, beautiful bushes. And they put out these lovely white flowers for the bees and then these lovely little um, sour cherries. And we, we pick a lot and we make juice from it or the birds eat them, you know, and I'm very happy that the birds eat them. So um, it's, and that's another thing too, is like it becomes much more of like a, an open harvest. I mean, there's some trees that I really want to protect, but a lot of it, it's for the birds. And I've started now to plant crab apples that keep the crab apples all winter long. There's some varieties, they're called winter persistent crab apples. And they'll, they'll have these little apples all, all the way until March. And that allows a lot of birds to stay and live there all the way through the winter. And so you're creating this whole bubble of life, this ecosystem that never was there before. And by almost like putting the, putting the buffet out for everybody. It's all about the food. So that was an amazing project you accomplished. So what do you have coming up? down the line over the next couple of years, what are some other things you've got your hands dipped into? My biggest focus now is, uh, is going to be Hawaii. Um, besides that, I have, I have five acres in Woodstock, New York, and it's all kind of um, rock and trees, and it needs, um, you have to hike into it off the road. There's no driveway. I would love to do a little food forest campground there. But right now, my main focus, I would probably even sell that land, but I'm, uh, I'm really focusing on Hawaii. So I'm going to be moving back to the Big Island. It's actually near the town of Pahoa, which is where the lava flow is happening right now. And it's about maybe 15 minutes south of that. So we're not going to be affected by this lava flow. But um, it's really one of the most beautiful areas I've ever lived in, in uh, no, I've ever traveled to in my life. And there's these black sand beaches. And the, the, all the people there are very much like, I don't know how to say it, our people. You know, people are really into gardening and food and yoga. And people will speak with you. And they're so interested in what you have to say. Like, the, the, no one's, like, busy, like, here in New York. And people will sit with you on the beach and they'll just have, like, a really nice, authentic conversation all the time. And so I've partnered up with my friend. He's um he's in his mid fifties, and he's had this property. Uh, the area is called Lower Puna, P U N A, and uh, right on the Red Road. It's like the main road there. They call it the Red Road, and he's got a, a property there, and it's three acres. It's a and it's an established food forest. It's all off grid solar. He collects rainwater. And it's a beautiful home, and he's got three cabins and now a dome. So we're going to start doing retreats out of there. We're going to start doing Airbnb style, and especially the retreats I'm really excited for. And then just to live there again, and I'm going to buy like a small pickup truck and and start doing more things at the farmer's market. There's a lot of aloe in the area, large amounts of coconuts. Um, I bought a, a tree stand that climbs coconut trees. So um, I can get up there and just harvest every day, you know, a couple hundred dollars worth of coconuts. And when, I, when I go up into one tree, I'll usually get about 40, 40 coconuts. And, um, you know, the climber cost me $300. But when I do the math about what uh, an organic wild Hawaiian coconut would cost in New York City, it's almost as if every time I go up in the tree, I've paid for that climber. So, um, and then you're, oh, you're you know, 40 feet up in the air. I have all the ropes and stuff, so I lower the coconut racks down and drinking maybe a gallon a day of this stuff. And it's it's just like, it becomes you, you know, it becomes your body. And uh, I really love it out there. And it's a very low stress lifestyle. When you're more tapped into the permaculture out there and you're into the farmer's markets, you spend extremely little on food in comparison to the mainstream who's buying imported products from the mainland. Uh, it, it really becomes the opposite. It's it, it's almost like it's cheaper to live in Hawaii when you're tapped into this lifestyle. But when you're a mainstreamer, Hawaii is going to bite you in the butt because you have to play by those rules. You have to deal with imports and 
expensive energy and uh, all those all those things. You know, t- maybe the tourism side of it. Luckily, on the east side of the Big Island, on the Hilo side, it's far fewer tourists, and it's just uh, and actually now with the volcano, it's going to be probably even less. But that could be a good thing. You know, it keeps it a little more pure. And the area is the area is so beautiful, and there's you know you just walk down the road and you see 20 passion fruits sitting on the ground. You know you just pick them up off the off in the ditch. I see these for sale for three dollars each <laughs> in New York City. I just pick up sixty dollars worth of passion fruits. Like it's just weird. It's so abundant, it's so abundant. And again, and the community is just super nice. It really feels like Northern California, West Coast kind of feel. You know, people are very, very cool and very authentic. You know, you do kind of get that hippie side a little bit, but um, people are active there, and I like it. You know, it's good. So that's what I'm going to be focusing on. I don't know how long I will stay out there. It's my intention to pretty much base myself there. Maybe even start raising a family out there in a couple of years. Um, but there's always the Minnesota Garden, and I'd like to go back there in the summertime and visit my family, plant more stuff, and then um, possibly have retreats out of Minnesota. I'm just not so sure if I want to bring it so close to my family's place. Um, but the idea of doing it in Hawaii is is for sure going to happen. Wow, Hawaii sounds amazing. And I'm so glad you touched on your coconut climber because I saw the video online of you climbing up the tree yeah. with that, and it. That seems pretty awesome. So we'll have to link up the uh, that video in the show notes. What's yeah. your uh, What's your YouTube channel, Anthony? Just so everybody can go check that out. My YouTube is Raw Model. Yeah, because I, I started making videos in I think 2007 with uh, a lot of you know uh, recipes and and things both based on food. And then in about 2010, I started to transition over to more garden stuff. And I opened up a Grow Paradise channel. But I already had so many subscribers with the um, with the Raw Model channel that I felt like I could get more people to watch the videos if I just continued on with that channel. So it's Raw Model, one word. Right. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And it's great for people to see your evolution and transition yes. over the years, too. So mm-hmm. that's great. Uh, I really felt like that was that was the best option. And then, yeah, all the previous subscribers could see the new videos without having to refine it. Yeah. Yeah, Anthony's got a lot of great videos. I highly recommend you guys go on and check that out and uh, get an idea of his coconut climber and, and his whole journey through through health, like we discussed earlier. Mm-hmm. So, Anthony, you touched on your retreat in Hawaii a little bit. Do you want to give us the details about that? Sure, sure. I've been, um, I've been helping, uh, assisting on retreats for quite a few years now. Uh, with different groups, some based on food, some based more on permaculture. And I've always wanted to do my own, but just a lot of things kind of come up. You have to have property set up. You have to all these things. And I always wanted to do it in Minnesota, but my parents just weren't so keen on having it so close to home. And everything really fell into place with this Hawaii situation. So this is actually the residence that I'm living in. And uh, it's a three-acre homestead, really established. Um, we make noni juice. We make coconut. I mean, the, the noni trees are huge. It's really like noni land. I mean, Actually, Noni Land in Kauai gets all their Noni products from the Big Island because the soil there, Noni is really like uh, hardcore volcanic soil. They, they'll grow in nasty stuff. So there's just large amounts of Noni. We're going to be making so many different foods. This is my first self-led retreat. Uh, I feel very ready for it, though, and we have the itinerary all planned out, and I have a lot of good helpers with me that are going to make this super smooth. Um, I'm offering different price levels. It's quite affordable. It doesn't include um, the airfare, of course, because we have people coming from California and um, East Coast, but it's starting at $800. And that's more for the folks that want to kind of share. We're going to sleep in the dome. Uh, There's going to be tenting options because we're right by the cliffs. So if anyone wants to camp out on the cliffs overlooking the ocean, that's available. And then we also have the private cabins and we have the private bedrooms in the home. So if people want a little more, a little more luxury, but it's still going to include all the food. Uh, all the food is going to be very raw friendly. It will be, I'm not sure yet. Um, so far, everybody that signed up pretty much seems to be preferring plant-based. So um, we're, we're definitely going to go with whatever everyone prefers and no one will be uh, unsatisfied. If someone wanted something else, we'll definitely make sure that they have that. But right now, it's leaning more towards plant-based. And we're going to be doing clinics on climbing the coconut, processing coconut, making our own coconut oil, uh, making poi, taro poi, 
um, working with uh, working with the land, gardening. I'm going to have a yoga instructor come on, and she'll do uh, she'll do a few classes. We're having a sound healing guy come in, and he's going to be doing sound healing at nighttime and playing the didgeridoo. And we're going to be swimming with real wild dolphins off the Kona coast. Uh, last time I went, we swam with about 80 wild dolphins. And um, it's right before they start to go to bed around noon. And you kind of just hang out with them and swim and they'll circle around you. And it's nothing like the aquarium experience. It's really, it's like almost being in church or something. It's, uh, you almost feel so humbled by their purity. I, I don't know. Um, we're going to go hike the volcanoes. We're going to check it all out. Um, it's, and I'm also tailoring it towards any physical abilities. You know, whatever you can do. If you can do the hikes, that's cool. If not, it's going to be very mellow, too. Um, people have the option of staying back at home base and just relaxing uh, in the hammock and making food. So if someone feels like maybe they can't do some of this more strenuous stuff, we're really not going to have too much. I think the most strenuous thing is walking down to Gehenna Beach just because there's some, like, big, big steps. But otherwise, it's going to be very easy, very applicable for everyone. We're going to do a static dance. Uh, at this place called Kalani. It's a, f- a little famous place, uh, the birthplace of ecstatic dance. And it's where it's they play really like uplifting, um, I wouldn't say house music, but it's just like really uplifting and good and, and it's so fun to dance to. But the rule is you cannot speak while you're on the dance floor. And that eliminates a lot of small talk and people trying to hit on each other and all that kind of stuff that can break you out of your flow. So we're going to introduce people to that. No one's going to be forced to dance, of course. They can sit there and watch, but it's all included in the price. Uh, a lot of cool day trips. We're going to go to Green Sand Beach as well, if people know where that is, down on the south part of the island. Uh, check out an organic coffee place. Try a lot of cool things. There's a, a famous, um, his name is Ken Love, and he's a chef, but he's a famous um, tree planting guy, and he lives in Hawaii, and they have a garden planted on the Kona side. And we're going to walk around that garden as well. So it's basically like touring paradise. I'm not going to make it so lecture heavy because I feel like the the retreat itself is going to be educational enough and inspirational. And we're going to we're going to be living in a paradise homestead that's off grid, full of food. We're going to be hanging out with each other, making new friends. That's going to be the lessons really. So we're going to have a few workshops, but it's not going to be so intellectually heavy. It's available if people want it, and we're all going to be hanging out talking about this stuff anyways. But no one's going to have to worry about any kind of like certification or classwork. It's all going to be hands-on, but very fun and light. And again, like the land, I feel, is the biggest teacher. You know, sleeping in a permaculture farm and seeing, you know, we're going to, every morning we're going to pick aloe and citrus and we're going to make smoothies and um, it's going to be very, very fun. So I'm, I'm excited. There's about five spots left. Uh, I was going to, I'm camping it at 14. So we keep it more intimate and we're going to rent two vans. So people have space and, um, but we're going to cap it at 14 for this first one. And then I intend to do one every two months from then on out. And then if it goes really well, I'm going to do it once a month. So, um, and just letting people explore the grow paradise lifestyle really, um, you know, food, uh, fun, people, uh, activities, fresh air. It's going to be tough to leave, I think. So, uh, <laughs> I the, bet. Yeah, the site is growparadise.com slash retreat, and all the details are there. And we have five spots left. So if anyone's interested in this one, it'll be very good. Wow, that sounds amazing. And it's definitely right up our alley. The thing I love about it, too, is that it's very inclusive. So it sounds like there'll be something there for everybody. And yeah. it just sounds like paradise on earth unbelievable good for you good luck to you and congrats on that thank you thank you it feels great like i've never considered myself a anywhere near a businessman or anything like that or but this retreat stuff it feels really good and again i I lay i lay in bed at night thinking about how to make it more magical and um i just ordered a bunch of grow paradise tote bags and we're going to make a cool gift bag for everybody that comes and, you know, give everyone their own beach towel for the week. And just like a lot of cool little things like a map. And uh, I just want it to be really special for people so they, they get that feel and they can take that energy back home with them and share it with their loved ones. Wow. Very cool. And what is the date to the first one? Uh, January 10th to the 17th. And because it's Hawaii, sometimes the flights can be a little weird is when people land. So we're giving folks the option of arriving a day early 
or if you need to stay a day later, whatever is comfortable for just $50. If you want to stay for $50 a night, uh, we'll totally take care of you. And you don't have to worry. I'll, and this includes all pickup and transport. So I'll come to the airport and get everybody. Uh, and we'll always be in touch. And I'm really, I just want people to be super happy and really well taken care of. Well, it sounds like it's going to be amazing. So, Anthony, let's switch gears a little bit here. And we're going to do something really fun our rapid fire round. So oh, we're cool. going to throw some rapid fire questions at you and you're just going to answer away first thing that comes to mind. Sound Excellent. good? Wow, that's cool. <laughs> okay, ready. <laughs> so your first question, where is your favorite place to travel to? Uh, I would say Southeast Asia. Um, but since I've been to the Big Island, it's kind of a tie, but I really like Southeast Asia because of the extensive fruit markets and I'm a huge durian fan. So to be able to go there and to be at the beaches with the with all the tropical fruits that are so hard to get in the U.S., um, if I had to choose one of those countries, it would either be um, it would be Indonesia, especially Bali, or Cambodia. And Cambodia is far different than Bali. It's a little more. It can be kind of a little somber because of the genocide and the poverty there. But you see beauty there and simplicity, which is very touching. And you come out of it feeling extremely lucky in life. And I've never, there were coconuts there that I feel like had a gallon of coconut water inside. Like they, they would open it and you had to bring a bottle with you to fill it and take it, take the remainder because you couldn't finish it in one sitting. Just so much liquid. <laughs> and the journey, That's amazing. I'd be in heaven. Yeah. Just, just, yeah, it's amazing. So, Anthony, what is one thing most people don't know about you? Hmm. One thing most people don't know about me. Um, hmm, let's see. Interesting. Um, I'll, I'll, here's one. When I was 19, I got in trouble for shoplifting. And I was always, it's just something that, I don't know, I had some kind of problem with the system or something, and I was at Kmart, and I got in trouble for shoplifting, and it was like probably one of the worst days of my life. And uh, there was some deeper, um, something going on with that, but um, I've really come out of it now, of course, and the idea of doing it now, I don't have the courage or the heart to do it. And uh, But that's something people don't know about me, probably. There was a little bit of a mild kleptomania when I was a teenager, a little bit. Interesting. Next right? question. <laughs> yeah, you know, we, all, we all have our own. Oh, oh yeah, sorry. and I think that's why wild food foraging and um, even dumpster diving was kind of cool for me because I felt like I could kind of get these things, but it wasn't like unethical or if, you know right. you feel like you scored, but yeah. Yeah, it fulfilled something for you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what is your favorite form of exercise? Hmm, it sounds funny, but maybe gardening. Um, doing like stretches when you go to pull weeds. It's almost like yoga gardening where you can kind of do like a, a warrior pose and pull. I really like that. But if I had to choose something that was extremely active, I would go for snorkeling with uh, s- snorkeling with fins and just going down and holding your breath and going like 15 feet down and checking out the rocks and, and just much more active. And, and then, and then when, once you start to see the wildlife, it's like a beautiful blend of activity and exploration. I would say snorkeling. Nice. That's cool that both your activities involve being outdoors and uh, the diversity between the two of them. So very cool. And Anthony, what do you prefer, kale or spinach? Well, I would say if I had, if I was eating them, I guess it kind of depends. Smoothie, spinach all the way for sure. Even salad, spinach. If I want something savory and cooked, I do like kale sautéed in coconut oil with butter with garlic. It's a really good dish, even if it's just steamed a little bit, or kale chips. It's kind of a tie-up. If I had to choose one, I would go with the spinach just because it's a little more neutral. It doesn't have that overpowering flavor. And I do like it in smoothies. It blends very well. Let's see spinach. Okay, good answer. Yeah. So we're going to go a little deep here. Okay. What's your biggest fear in life? Um, biggest fear in life, I would say... Maybe the feeling of failure, and that was a feeling I think I always carried with me about these retreats and stuff was that nobody would show up. You know, it's like I wanted to do something outside of modeling, but I was always scared that it wasn't going to work. So the the fear of failure, and I think that affects a lot of us, you know, wanting to do our passion, but still having that, you know, the golden handcuffs or something that's keeping us from trying these things. 
Um, I think that's it. Uh, I mean, it could go pretty deep with some of like the, you know, wanting people to, you know, worrying about people not creating paradise and what's going to happen like in the next 20 years. But I think deep down right now, which affects me besides extremely deep and dark water is the fear of failure. Yeah, that makes sense. I think a lot of us have that and a lot of us feel like we're never ready and, never and that ready. just, yes. you, nobody's ever ready. You just have to jump in and do it and, and everything ends up working out well. Yeah, we're really, yeah, it's that idea of playing it safe all the time and people want to be properly prepared and, and then, yeah, it just keeps us in this really inactive mode. And when this is the time to be so active and it snowballs on itself. And if you get active now, then you learn more faster and you're almost throwing yourself into the fire to have to learn more. So just do it, you know, it's like, this is not the time to be sitting on our thumbs. Just do it. That just summarizes it. it. Yeah. So true. It's so important right now. Anthony, last rapid fire question. I'm going to set the scene here. You're stuck on an island. You only have one food with you. What would you pick? Wild pig. <laughs> <laughs> Wild pig? Yeah. Okay, there you go. <laughs> I, I thought you were going to go with the coconut, but... I know. I think for long term, coca. It would be that's the beauty of Hawaii. It's basically coconuts and wild pig. Um, if I had to choose plant, I would say coconut. Yes, but it, it's, okay. a, it's a definite. It would be actually a lot easier to deal with the coconuts than the pigs. So, um, <laughs> if I'm by myself, I'm gonna say coconuts. If I'm with other people, I'm maybe we can team up on stuff. But yeah, I'm gonna say coconuts. <laughs> there you go. Great answer. That's awesome. Cool. Is that it? All right, Anthony. Uh, we're going to start to wrap things up here, but one last question we have for you, and we ask this to all the guests at the end of the show. What's one thing we can all take away from this interview and apply to our lives right away towards helping us reach ultimate health? It's the idea that um, we as humans have the power uh, to create paradise. And not uh, in a faraway land, but right where we live. And that by taking those steps, we empower ourselves and our loved ones and our neighbors to live um, much cleaner and much more abundant and stress-free lives. So um, there's a lot of spirituality out there, a lot of, and a lot of it doesn't hold weight for me unless they're talking about physical paradise creation, uh, making a better surroundings, better habitat for us to live in, and then um, then we get on to the other things. But I think uh, we, we tend to put the cart before the horse, so to speak, because people want to get into meditation and spirituality, but if you're not living in an environment that's conducive to mental clarity and peace and, you know, uh, all the stress of paying the bills, then it's really hard to get there. So I think paradise creation, that we really have the power to grow paradise and to see, you know, it, yeah, it's something with these spiritual gurus and the teachers is that they never talk about this. They never talk about plant all the, plant a beautiful garden in each person's um, surroundings. So then all the, they're taken care of and they don't have to worry about the uh, taxes or this or this. It's really paradise creation by humans. And we have the tools more than ever with like, you know, a bulldozer or a caterpillar. These tools can do a lot of destruction, but they can also create um, a beautiful, curvy landscape, in, which was once just a GMO cornfield. You know, so we have a lot of tools at our disposal and a lot of resources, a lot of financial resources to do this. And if we can do it now, within three years or four years, we could be pretty much completely free. So paradise creation is the biggest thing here. All right, that's great. Create paradise, and you can do that right in your own location where you're at now. It doesn't have to be... Uh, massive shift. So we all have the potential to do that. It's that term of, you know, when, you, when uh, in an emergency, make sure your own life vest is on before you help the next person. And if we can't do that for ourselves first, what can we, it's the same with love. Like if you don't deeply love yourself first, how can you share love with others? You know, and I think it's the same way with self-sufficiency and sustainability. It has to come from ourselves first. And then people will see it. They'll be like, whoa, like, Look at all that cool stuff in their yard, and they don't spend any money on food anymore, and it's like printing money, basically. So that's, yeah, that's it for sure for me. Well, you're making all this really cool and out there for people to see, so thank you for that, and, and thanks. thanks for all the information you've shared on today's show. This has been fantastic. 
Can you share with us, Anthony, where you'd like people to go to get more information on you and uh, find out a little bit more about what you're what you're up to? Sure, of course. Um, it's uh, growparadise.com. And then all the tabs are right up on top. You can check the About Us segment. And then on the bottom are the is a YouTube link and a Facebook link on the bottom of the page. And then that'll take you to, um, to those respective sites and you can see some of the more updated videos. And I'm quite active on Facebook still. So there's always that. And there's also an Instagram link on the bottom. So growparadise.com and you can check out the retreat if it's coming as well. Nice. Yeah, definitely check out that retreat if you're interested. It sounds like it's going to be an amazing, transformative experience. So good for you. you. And Anthony, this has been this has been a blast. And and there's so much more we could ask you. So I hope down the line we can have you back on and dig into some more more of these questions that that are popping in my head as we go through this. This is this is very inspiring, very informative. and, And we both thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, Anthony. Yeah, it's been a pleasure speaking with you both. Thank you so much for having me. Please head on over to ultimatehealthpodcast.com and check out the show notes, and you'll find links to everything Anthony's been discussing today. And, yeah, share a comment over there and keep the discussion going so we can we can all be active in this conversation together. We have one call to action for you. Please head on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and review That just helps our show get more exposure and boosts us up in the ranks so more people can get this health message. So we'll be talking to you guys soon. Take care.